Hello, welcome. Thank you for joining us on this edition of News 2. I'm Sandra Gomez Singh, topping our newscast. Christmas may have come a bit late for government employees, but it came nonetheless. That's after Governor Kenneth Mapp made a major announcement Tuesday. The administration says government workers can expect more money in their paychecks soon. News 2's April Knight has that story. Government employees are starting off the new year with some good tidings from Government House. Governor Kenneth Mapp announced Tuesday during a press conference that they're getting their much-awaited pay increases. The government workers across the territory, unionized and non-unionized, that the Lieutenant Governor and I will now begin to execute our a commitment that we will begin to implement pay increases for government workers. The governor made clear that this does not address retro pay. On Tuesday, he also announced the appointment of Natalie Nelson Tang Ho as the new Virgin Islands chief government negotiator. According to the governor, Tang Ho will now have to work with unions to determine how much exactly is owed to their members. Governor Mapp said some 1,008 government employees will be receiving step in increases worth $7.4 million effective January 1, 2016. But so far, those raises are only being given to seven agencies. Bureau of Internal Revenue, the Division of Personnel, the Virgin Islands Police Department, sworn personnel and civilian personnel, the Department of Licensing and Consumer Affairs, the Virgin Islands Fire Service, the Department of Agriculture and the Department of Finance. The financial team is still working on which agencies are going to be next in line, said Mapp. But he said the public should not worry because no agency will be left behind. Teachers or uh, other workers in other departments and agencies, human services, what have you, we're not leaving you out, we're not forgetting you. Uh, because you're a much larger agency, the reconciliation process uh, takes time. Reporting for News 2, I'm April Knight. And we will have more from that press conference in Wednesday's newscast. Just a quick note, the governor will be leaving the territory to meet with cruise line executives in Florida and will be returning on Thursday, January 14th. In his absence, Lieutenant Governor Osbert Potter will serve as acting governor. Meanwhile, Sugar Bay Resort and Spa on St. Thomas is not starting the new year with good news. The hotel got dropped by AM Resorts at the end of 2015 and also got scathing reviews on TripAdvisor. Then recently they gave some employees the pink slip. News to April Night has more. 2016 has not been good so far to Sugar Bay Hotel. It's been taking hits from multiple fronts since the beginning of the year. After a year and a half, AM Resorts, which manages the Dreams brand, officially ended its contract with Sugar Bay on St. Thomas on December 31st. Dreams pulling out has caused concerns among clients, especially when they Google the hotel and it says permanently closed. And then on Friday, some employees were met with bad news Notices of termination effective immediately that left them scrambling for new jobs or lining up for unemployment benefits. According to the termination letter, low occupancy levels and reduced business are the reasons why these employees are being laid off and that their benefits will only last until January 31st. But according to a news due source, their woes did not end there. One former employee who declined to be named said he was already three hours into the workday when he got called into human resources and informed that he was being laid off. He was told to take the letter to Department of Labor, but he said when he got there, he was informed that there was some dispute about the company's payments to the department for their unemployment benefits. Department of Labor did not return a voice message requesting a confirmation of this claim. Sugar Bay Resorts also did not return requests requests for comment by news time reporting for news 2 i'm april knight and count on two we will update you on any comments from either sugar bay resorts or the department of labor on the recent terminations of the hotel's employees well friends family members and supporters are asking for the community's help after that shooting at st thomas's eclipse lounge last saturday as we reported two men were left dead during an exchange of gunfire Meanwhile, a third victim was shot while he was standing in the area of the shootout. That victim, pictured there, 29-year-old Bobby James, did not sustain fatal wounds, but it was very close. 
He had to have emergency surgery, and due to his injuries, he will be out of work until he can fully recover. And Bobby does not have health insurance. Supporters have set up a GoFundMe account, and that account is www.gofundme.com forward slash Bobby VI. Now, this fund, they say, will assist with the medical bills and his livelihood while he is down recovering. Family members say he is doing much better today, but is still dealing with complications from his wounds. Now, meanwhile, police say after the shootout, a security guard fired back. The two gunshots were confirmed in the initial shooting between the victims. They could not confirm on Monday, that's the last report we have, how many shots were fired in the secondary shooting involving the security guard. According to preliminary investigations, the gunfire outside occurred outside of the establishment but police could not say whether it all started within the club. The identity of the two victims have not been released. However, investigations are still ongoing. Monday, January 11th at 11.34 p.m., officers received notification from the 911 emergency call center regarding a woman being treated at the Schneider Regional Medical Center who had experienced a traumatic fall. Officers made contact with the victim's husband, who stated that he and his wife had been in their rental unit at Point Pleasant. He had been watching television in the living room while she was in the unit's bedroom. He heard a noise, went to check on his wife. The bathroom door was locked, so he called out to her, forced the door open, and saw his wife's body on the ground. The victim's wife succumbed to the injuries in the approximately 40-foot fall. On Saturday, January 9th at 8 p.m., Jenny Lima, 21, of Estate Bovoni, was arrested and charged with possession of a controlled substance to distribute after a search warrant was executed at her residence. Upon arrival at the scene, police discovered 32 marijuana plants, approximately two to three feet tall, in the backyard of Lima's residence. Bail for Jenny Lima was set at $10,000. Unable to post bail, she was remanded to the Bureau of Corrections pending her advice to rights hearing. Thursday, January 7, Stephen Frank Coleman, 48, was arrested and charged with unauthorized use of a vehicle at 2.45 p.m. Bail was set at $10,000. On December 28, he had been identified as the individual captured on video surveillance who had stolen merchandise from a retailer located in Havenside Mall. Bail for Coleman on the charge of grand larceny was set at $35,000. On Thursday, January 7th at 4.55 p.m., Marty Leroy Glover, 54, was arrested and charged with third-degree burglary in connection with three separate incidents. Glover was identified via surveillance video that captured him removing items from the Big Kahuna on January 2nd, 3rd, and 4th. Bail for each incident was set at $25,000. On Thursday, January 7th at 4.55, Ginger R. Grimes, 46, was arrested and charged with aiding and abetting. Grimes was identified via surveillance video that captured her assisting Marty Glover as he removed items from the Big Kahuna on the same dates. Bail for each incident was set at $10,000. On Thursday, January 7 at 11 a.m., officers attached to the St. John Leander Jurgen Command held its quarterly recognition presentation providing acknowledgement to those outstanding officers covering the period of October to December 2016, uh, 2015 rather, honored were Arlene Chowell, St. John Deputy Chief of Police, Officer Thompson Alexander, Officer Josiah Angol, and Officer Misty Prescott. That presentation was held at the St. John Legislative Building in Cruz Bay. Big congratulations to the outstanding officers. Turn our attention overseas. President Obama is set to deliver his final State of the Union address to Congress and the American people, and he wants to begin the final months of his presidency on an optimistic note. Karen Kaifa takes a look at what we can expect tonight. I want to identify three or four big ideas. It is the final time President Obama will perform this Washington ritual. As such, it will be different than years past. He wants to talk about the future of this country. He's very optimistic about the future of this country. But Republicans are not as optimistic as seen on the presidential campaign trail. And getting much done with a GOP-controlled Congress is unlikely. I don't think the president has brought us in the right direction. I think he's put us down a dangerous path. 
and we need to get on the other path. So in an interview with NBC's Today Show, the president suggested his speech may be aimed less at Congress and more at those watching at home. But there's no doubt that uh, politics in Washington are so much more divided than the American people are. The president will likely highlight economic recovery and seek to calm fears about ISIS and the threat of domestic terrorist acts like San Bernardino. Last week, the president outlined executive actions on gun control, and he may act alone to fulfill another longtime goal, closing the military prison at Guantanamo Bay, Cuba. Tonight's speech, a rough draft of sorts of how he plans to wind down his administration. As for the final draft of that address... The president typically uh, uh, is working on this uh, on, the, on the State of the Union um, you know, pretty close to the, up to the last minute, and I would anticipate that that'll be true uh, this year as well. In Washington, I'm Karen Kaifa. And keeping our eye on the economy, let's take a look at the New York Stock Exchange with the Stock Market Watch. Taking a look at the numbers there, everything up, the Dow up 117, NASDAQ 47, S&P 500 up 15. Coming up on News 2, the latest regarding a dispute between a radio station and WAPA, stemming from some unpaid electric bills. The deal's coming up. Welcome back. JKC Communication and the Virgin Islands Water and Power Authority are in dispute over unpaid electrical bills. JKC Communications broadcasts several local radio stations from uh, throughout the territory and in response to a radio ad created by JKC Communications, WAPA's Executive Director and CEO Hugo Hodge Jr. released a statement expressing that the radio ad was a propaganda campaign. Here's more. The billing disputes between JKC Communication and the Virgin Islands Water and Power Authority have been an ongoing issue for over three years. Yesterday, WJKC's communications owner, Jonathan Cohan, ran a radio ad on the popular radio station IL-95, stating that he had unresolved issues with the Virgin Islands Water and Power Authority, resulting in the radio station leaving the airwaves for several days. Although the radio ad that aired on aisle 95 stated that the station was off air for several days, no JKC radio station was reported to have stopped operating. News 2 reached out to both Jonathan Cohen and the WAPA executive director, Hugo Hodge. Jonathan Cohen contacted us back and agreed to an interview. And I feel like we have a good relationship with WAPA over the last 32 years, and I want to continue to have a good relationship. We just need to sit down and work out these uh, discrepancies. Jonathan Cohen stated that the fuses on the electricity pole that provides electricity to his radio stations were disconnected rather than being disconnected at the meter. Cohen gave TV2 first-hand proof that he was operating off generator power and stated that he has been using generator power since September of 2015. So all I want to do is get back to business and work this out and continue to do what I do and provide good programming, play the music, keep the news out there, and God forbid if there's an emergency, be able to be there and um, transmit the information as needed. Reporting for News 2, Stephanie Brown. WAPA's Executive Director Hugo Hodge Jr. stated in a press release that he understands and appreciates the role that all radio stations play in service to the community. However, WAPA administers a disconnect and delinquent policy fairly and across the board to all customers. Count on two to keep you updated. Marvin Pickering, who is the director of the Virgin Islands Bureau of Internal Revenue, reminds taxpayers that the IRS is providing taxpayers with the opportunity to order forms W2VI and the information returns online. The link to the IRS online ordering site can be accessed by visiting the Bureau's website. The Bureau has received a limited number of forms this year, he says, so businesses are strongly urged to use the online services to receive their forms in time for the filing deadline.
It's a new year and we are excited to include our segment during the entire month of January. Tips to start the year off right with small, manageable changes to your lifestyle, whether it's health or even a new look. First of all, let's talk about a healthy smile. A reminder about why regular dental visits are important, how often and what you should be doing every day in between your regular dental visits. Dental visits are important because they help keep your teeth and gums healthy. You should have a regular dental visit at least every six months and floss regularly. Most of us know this, but do you know why this is recommended? The oral cavity is the gateway to your body. Um, we know from research that there are links to other systemic diseases. There are two parts to a regular dental visit. One part is the checkup, the other is the cleaning. Your dental professional will check for cavities and see if there is plaque or tartar on the teeth. Plaque is a clear, sticky layer of bacteria that can harden and become tartar. You cannot remove tartar with brushing and flossing. If plaque and tartar build up on your teeth, they can cause oral diseases. Dentists check for more things as well. Um, unless you're in pain, we treat the pain first. We try to do a full set of x-rays, examine your whole mouth, diagnose any problems. Uh, we look for cavities. We do all cancer screening. We look for anything on the tissue that's abnormal. Um, and we look at the overall health of your oral cavity. With healthy gums, the spaces are shallow. When people have gum disease, the spaces may become deeper. The dentist checks this. We do a little bit more than fillings. We do a lot of things, um, root canals, uh, crowns, dentures, implants, um, Botox, um, TMD, temporomandibular disorder treatment. Um, so it's not just fill and, fill and pull anymore. It's a lot more trying to save teeth. We recommend that you see the dentist every six months for a healthy patient, um, gum-wise. Now what should you do between visits? Here are some tips. Brush your teeth at least twice a day. Be sure to use a toothpaste that contains fluoride. Floss at least once a day. Use a mouth rinse to help get rid of plaque bacteria. This will also help freshen breath. And plus, a nice smile says a lot. That's right, be sure to count on two. We'll have some more uh, New Year, New You events coming up this month. Well, a two-day interactive workshop and discussion on how climate change affects the Virgin Islands is scheduled for January 12th to the 13th from 9 a.m. to 4.30 p.m. at the UVI Administration and Conference Center free at the Conference Center. Featured speaker is Professor Michael Taylor of the Climate Studies Group, Mona Campus, University of the West Indies. The event is presented by the Caribbean UVI's Caribbean Green Technology Center and the Climate Studies Group, University of the West Indies. Be sure to stick around. Your news to AccuWeather forecast comes your way next.